Awesome. Yeah, that that would be an option. Let's go. Let's start. Are we good? It's running. All right. So, let's go for the last one. Uh, well, not, not really the last one, but the last talk before we go to the panel. Um, and this one's going to be with Lex, obviously, as you know. And we close the brackets. We opened the brackets yesterday, um, and then uh, we're going to close it. So I would say, like, uh, like Objective-C should really close its brackets. It's time. Go home, Objective-C. You're drunk. Uh, <laughs> you Auto-release yourself, please. Auto release yourself, it's interesting, because it's very hard to auto release somebody else. Um, damn, <laughs> you nerd not using Arc. Uh, <laughs> and uh, while well, Objective Cologne kind of closed its brackets also, the, the not SwiftConf, but Objective Cologne. So, uh, um, and as, as far as SwiftConf goes, we basically did kind of a try catch. Well, sorry, a do catch, try. Do catch, try, do try catch, whatever. Block. We'll see how far it goes, and we'll see next year. Um, don't ask the, the regular question, is it going to happen next year? Because as Philip will tell you, we never know. Um, this is the beauty of it. Um, and um, um, yeah, I wanted to say uh, actually a super thanks to uh, Seven Principles, 7P, as we call it, uh, for organizing this thing. I, I mean, for financing this thing, <laughs> again. So Oli, which is my team manager, which was here with a with a white uh, shirt, uh, was here this morning, uh, and 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 Andreas, which is hiding somewhere. Where are you? He's hiding, right? Um, somewhere. Uh, he used to sit down there where Marco is. So thanks to those guys. If it wasn't for them, this probably this thing probably wouldn't have happened this year. So it's pretty cool. Um, I I thought I had. Last slide, but we'll see. Uh, super thanks, obviously, to all the speakers. A round of applause for all the speakers. Because if there, if, there, if there are no speakers, it's me speaking all the whole day long. I'm, I'm sure you don't want to do that. Or beatbox all day long. Yeah, that's going to be a hard one. And obviously, to you guys, all the attendees, because without the attendees, this wouldn't going to happen. Um, also, I wanted to thank, obviously, Bank Software, uh, Bastian, and Kino was there, because <laughs> for a very simple reason, that this is going to spare me a heck of a lot of time, <laughs> because I can tell you, I spent the last two, the the two previous years, I spent probably two weeks in Final Cut Pro, uh, I guess, and this is two full weeks of work, so that's. Uh, probably a best solution. And last, uh, you know which, which, which uh, I, I started with this flying phoenix? We'll see. I hope it's going to be like the phoenix, but I hope it's not going to be. And this is the, the, the animation that I will require to all my speakers as of next year. Obviously, everybody should have a flame animation. <laughs> oh, these are all the guys eating meat, right? <laughs> well, like, oh, an animal. Oh, he actually burned. Yeah, you criminals. Um, anyways, uh, let's go to. Uh, um, what, uh, there's something wrong here. The panel is there and not. Uh, oh no, there's nothing wrong. I just didn't present you this time, Lex. That's it, ladies and gentlemen, Lex Friedman. <laughs> Presented. Thanks, man. No, of course you did. Well, first, I mean, we should also probably give a round of applause to Stuff for pulling off another incredible conference. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, uh, the good news is you've made it, right? You got through all the presentations, you stayed awake, you didn't get too drunk last night or the night before, so that's good. Maybe you did and I didn't see. I didn't see anybody throwing up, which is always a good sign, uh, so congrats on that. Um, I consider, even though there's a panel after me, I consider very high pressure and also, you know, very, I guess, an honor to, to close out, to do the last talk of a conference. So I, I hope I can do something here to leave you inspired. But if I let you down, then we'll be box some more. But this talk is called Think Like a Podcast Ad Salesperson, or at least it's supposed to be called Think Like a Podcast Ad Salesperson. That's the talk I'm supposed to do. It comes out of a talk that Stuff saw me do previously at NSConf that was called uh, Be Apple-like. Um, so uh, we're going to mix and match the talks a little bit. It's a remix. Uh, again, I am Lex Friedman. You can follow me on Twitter if you're so inclined. 
Uh, I have multiple ways that you can contact me. I have more than one email address that works. You can use whichever one works for you. Uh, my, my qualifiers for being here, just to recap, I was once a Macworld senior writer, so I knew a whole lot about Apple. That's long ago. Now I'm a Macworld senior contributor, which means they don't pay me, but I still write for them on occasion. Uh, and I have that job at Midroll, where I sell ads for podcasts. So when you hear ads for Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website, that's thanks to me. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so think like a podcast ad salesperson. Again, that's what I'm supposed to do. But again, it comes from a different talk. And since I already had that one written, let's start there, because it's going to be way easier for me. And that talk was Be Apple-like. But the first time I presented this talk of Be Apple-like, I didn't really like the hyphen or the, the like. So then I said, maybe I'll call it Be Apple-ish. I still didn't love the hyphen there, so then I called it Be Apple-ish. But I thought that looked a little weird with the EI, so I went with Be Apple-ish. But that looks like an iPhone app. It didn't work, so I put the E back in, which was better. But the thing is, I don't want you to be exactly like Apple. I want you to be sort of like Apple. So let's go with be Apple-ish-ish, -ish, but if we do that, we're going to need the hyphen back. Okay, that works for me. Be Apple-ish-ish. -ish. I think we've done it. Good job, everybody. Now, this leads to one big question. If I'm asking you to be Apple-ish-ish, -ish, what does that mean? And I will try to explain. You could define Apple-ish in a couple different ways. You know, it's an adjective. You could say it's being worth more than $500 billion. Like those WhatsApp guys are rich, but they're sure not Apple-ish. Uh, that's one definition, but that's not what I mean. What I'm suggesting that you should be Apple-ish or Apple-ish-ish, what I'm suggesting you should do is imitate Apple's less obvious qualities. There are obvious things that Apple does really well. I don't need to tell you about those, and it's obvious that we all want to emulate them, their design, their attention to detail. But I want to look at some different buckets. Uh, is anybody here familiar with this acronym, POF? PATH. What's good is that there are, oh, okay, stuff is, because he's in four. The good thing is there are no liars here because I made that up. Uh, but so PAF, P-A-F-F, or P-A-A-F, I'll explain what my made-up acronym means to you now. The P in PAF is for patience. Apple is patient. This is an easy example. Apple launched the iPhone in 2007. Cut, copy, and paste didn't show up until 2009. Apple waited two years because they wanted to wait until they figured out how to do cut, copy, and paste the right way. They were patient enough to say, we're going to launch what we have now, and we'll wait until we're ready to, to launch something that we are proud of. Now, a very wise, very successful, very serious man is attributed, has this quote attributed to him, real artist's ship. So how do you reconcile real artist's ship with taking two years to ship, copy, and paste? To me, it's the same way you reconcile your mental image of Steve Jobs, if you can picture him in your head right now, and this photo of Steve Jobs. That's really him. That is not Ashton Kutcher, I swear. But uh, real artistship. In fact, this nuance, this deepness, this, the dichotomy of, of this photo being Steve Jobs, I think it exemplifies Apple's patience. Apple shipped the original iPhone. That was what they shipped. And then they said, we're patient. We're going to wait two years until we figure this out, figure out the right way to implement on a touch device, copy and paste. And they were patient enough to wait that two years to make it happen. Patience doesn't mean not shipping. That dog is being patient. That was kind of, okay. Ship now and be patient with features that'll take longer. Your customers will appreciate it. They'll appreciate that you're giving them something now instead of making them wait until everything is perfect. It's okay to ship what you've got and be patient and expect some patience on the part of your customers too. POF, back to POF. The P is for patience and the A is for adventurous. And it's also for ambitious. Or actually, the two A's together are for appropriately anarchic. Here's the nice thing. I made it up. It stands for whatever the hell I want it to stand for. So allow me to get meta for a moment. Because right now, I kind of regret going with a made-up acronym as like the cornerstone of this talk. So taking a step back, it was June 18th, 2015. It's not now. It was then. It was the 18th of June. I took a screenshot of where I was in the creation of this <laughs> keynote. You can even see my work email in the background there. And I, right now, and when I say right now, I'm talking about June 18th, 2015. I'm writing the words in these notes fields that I'm currently reciting, even though reading notes directly is very poor presentation form. And this is all going to get back to Apple in a second, but let me explain what's going on here, why these adjectives are the three things I want to focus on next. But I want to add some context as to how I got to this point in the narrative. You may recognize this fine gentleman. Months before the conference, Stuff reaches out to me and he says, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, I could do learning from Apple's mistakes, or I could do a new talk called Think Like a Podcast Ad Salesperson. 
And um, you remember, I did learning from Apple's mistakes yesterday, and Stuff was like, oh, I have a great idea. Why don't you do both of them? So <laughs> I'm here doing both of them. So, but he said, do think like a podcast ad sales guy. It's what I suggested, and he liked it. Uh, but as I said, the first time I ever made reference to this talk, I didn't actually do it, but I, I did like a miniature version of Think Like a Podcast Ad Salesperson. It was at NSConf, and it was called Be Apple-ish. -ish. And so when I opened up Be Apple-ish and was pulling out some of the slides for Think Like a Podcast Ad Salesperson, I was thinking to myself, boy, I really like that Be Apple-ish talk, and I want to kind of do some of that again, too. And I'm already here. He already flew me here, so I figured I can get away with doing some of that Be Apple-ish talk, too, since I think the two topics that I want to address dovetail nicely. Um, so hopefully I won't get in trouble with stuff later. You can beat me up if you need to. But so I've been doing my Be Apple-ish talk. When I promised stuff, I would be doing my Think Like a Podcast Ad Sales Guy talk. So here's the good news. I'm going to switch gears, at least briefly. So I'm going to present to you Think Like a Podcast Ad Sales Guy, the presentation that I was supposed to be doing already. So I promise it is going to get back to Apple eventually. I sell podcast ads. I am in sales. I don't think of myself as a salesperson, but there is no question I'm a salesperson. I have no sales experience. The only ads or anything that I've ever sold are podcast ads. Uh, I told a quick version of the story yesterday, a quick version again today, just as a recap, because I know it was a long day. I started selling ads for my own show, a podcast called Unprofessional. Then I started selling ads for another show on the same network, uh, the Mule Radio Network. Then I was selling ads for all 15 of Mule Radio shows, and then Marco asked me to start selling ATP, and Boing Boing started asking me to sell its shows. Macworld asked me to sell its show, and suddenly I was selling 50 shows, and I joined forces with Midroll about two and a half years ago, and I now, I still think of myself as an entrepreneur first, but I'm an entrepreneur who happens to flex his ad sales muscle most of the time. But now that I'm officially a salesperson, everything looks like sales to me. And despite having no formal sales training, this is a word I've learned to avoid. Uh, they probably teach that in sales classes. I've just never taken any. But you want to avoid the word no in my line of work. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with this show, Tomorrow with Joshua Topolsky. It's about 11 episodes in. Josh was the former editor-in-chief of The Verge. Uh, he's now the lead tech reporter for uh, Bloomberg. Spots on Tomorrow with Joshua Topolsky cost about $1,000. Gruber was a guest not too long ago, a couple weeks ago. And they fought the entire time. It was great. Um, but Spots on Tomorrow cost about $1,000 for a 60-second ad read by Josh. We sell out the show. It does very, very well. And people email me and ask about sponsoring the show. And sometimes they say, hey, mid-roll, we would like to buy ads on Tomorrow. We have $100. How many ads can we buy? Uh, Could we get a couple ads for $200? This is why I want to tell them. <laughs> That's the easy and correct answer. But it's not the best answer. It's not the right answer. I try every day not to be kind of the, the shady car salesman stereotype that people hate, um, where you're trying to weasel your way through just to get a deal signed. So I'm never going to lie to an advertiser and say, maybe there's a way we can make that work. No. But I'm not going to tell them no either. I go for honesty without dismissing what the potential, even if improbable, customer is asking about. So I say, tomorrow tends to sell out. So it's hard for me to offer discounts. It's $1,000. If you want to be on the show, it costs $1,000. You get the personal ad read from Josh himself. It's a show that's going to reach 40,000 proud nerds. There are other more affordable shows that might be more up your alley, that might fit your budget a little bit better. And so people always, you know, I always say, it might make more sense if budget's a factor. And budget is always a factor. And whenever I say budget is always a factor, I try to have a little wink in my voice when I say that. But at no point do I say to them explicitly, no, no, you can't be on Joshua Tobolsky's show. Say, so, you know, there's other shows that might fit your budget better. Fine. I don't even say, unfortunately, I can't get you on Joshua Topolsky's show. And I definitely don't say anything like this. I, might, I try not to even think it, to be honest. But I bring all this up because now that I'm a sales guy, which is the last job I ever expected, you know that old expression that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? I assume maybe that translates. Uh, that's MC Hammer. Uh, but when all you have a ha Stuff knew that because he's a rap enthusiast. But so when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Now that I'm a sales guy, everything looks like sales to me. And I think that everything is sales for you guys, too. So when I'm saying be Apple-ish, or rather be Apple-ish-ish, what I'm getting at is you, like Apple, should always be selling. <laughs> it was close. Now listen, you, like Apple, will always have unhappy customers. There are many ways to deal with unhappy customers. 
So when you encounter feedback from paying customers, or even potential customers, feedback like this, or like this, or the more modern equivalent of this, and of course there's the age-old question that many of you as iOS developers I'm sure hear far too often. When you encounter those questions, the tempting thing to say when you get feedback like this is effectively this, an expression I learned from Casey Liss on Twitter. Or perhaps worse, perhaps something involving the eggplant emoji, I don't know. But you want to respond angrily, and it makes sense. But that would be a mistake. Sorry, that would be, that would be a mistake, better. Instead, what you have to remember is as developers, you must always be selling. <laughs> My notes say, uh, click for hilarious joke. So that's what that's supposed to be, hilarious joke. Visit midroll, okay, always be selling. So uh, many, many of you may know James Thompson, who develops pCalc. Um, I once, when I first built this, some of this presentation, imagined an email that he could send to a customer. Uh, and this is that email. Thank you so much for the feedback. While I can't incorporate every feature request I receive, I appreciate your sharing these ideas. Ultimately, my inclination is that adding flatulent sound effects to pCalc would confuse most customers, but version 2.3 coming soon does add an emoji equal sign button. That's a response to what would clearly have been, it's fake, it's fake, but what would clearly have been lousy customer feedback, but instead of telling that customer to skull in a flame, he's finding a way to sell back to that customer. He's finding a way to say, thank you, Here's what's coming soon, you're going to keep loving it. This is not selling, and you see this all the time. You see this in so many app updates. What's new is general fixes. But this is selling. You can sell in your App Store update notes. Look at how Plants vs. Zombies here, and this was a long time ago, look at how they described you know, minor updates for stability. They said, a little polish to improve game stability. That is sales, baby. That's what that is. But if the update really is just bug fixes, it's okay. That's, I mean, even if that were the only line, I didn't have the other stuff there. A little polish to improve game stability. That's selling to a customer. That's one of the, you know, now that those, I mean, I hate the App Store pages these days where they collapse everything by default and you have to click to show more, but when you only get that couple lines of text, you gotta use it. But that's sales. Always be selling. What I do for a living is sell all the time to podcast advertisers. And I'm saying that that's what you guys do too, even if you don't always think of yourselves as salespeople. And this extends well beyond the app store. So this state of always be selling, of always be selling-ing, extends beyond the app store and beyond your inbox with that James Thompson Peacock example. It extends to your features. Everything in your app, you're selling it. The features you do and don't include are all part of sales. Your tutorial in the app is selling the app. Your button to exit the, tu the tutorial early for users who say, I don't need the tutorial, I just want to start using the app. That's sales. Your button in the settings section to restart the damn tutorial for people who skipped it and then realize I probably shouldn't skip that tutorial, that's also sales. It's all sales. It's Apple-ish to the core. Ah, it's a core. So, back to Puff and those A's in the middle, one of which I'm now saying stands for always, as in, say with me now, always be selling. But it can also stand for adventurous, and ambitious, or ambitiousness. Uh, two other key qualities, both of those, of Apple-ishness. Ishness. <laughs> Apple-ishness encompasses those adjectives, being adventurous and being ambitious. I would argue that this change from iOS 6 to iOS 7 was, whether you loved it or hated it or merely tolerated it, that was adventurous and ambitious. I talked a little bit yesterday about how everybody hates change, and Apple knows that you're going to hate change. They knew when they released iOS 7 that some people were going to say, this is beautiful, and some people were going to say, bring back my buttons. I talked about yesterday, every time Facebook has a new Facebook news feed, this is how humans respond to change. The new iTunes, this is how people respond to change. People hate every freaking change. Think about when Apple switched to the lightning adapter. When Apple introduced the Mac App Store. MagSafe 2 and those dinky little $20 adapters. The dock in OS X. Here's how people reacted to every one of those announcements. Not everybody, but a decent percentage of Apple's customer base responded to each one of those with that, the, the feeling that that emoji encapsulates. And yet Apple still made those choices. Apple is willing to take risks. They make these moves when they feel like this is a, the right long-term investment in the company and the right direction they want to be pulling their customers, even if it is kicking and screaming. It's worth the short-term frustrations. I talked a very tiny bit about this part yesterday with the new MacBook. But what I didn't get into is that you know, with this one port and its really weird keyboard that many people hate and some people tolerate. It's not a computer for everybody. And that's okay, not everybody has to want it. I don't want the MacBook. But not everybody wants a one port Mac. And I would say not even Apple wants a one port Mac. 
Phil Schiller, when he was on the talk show, told John Gruber, Apple really wants a zero port Mac, and this is the closest we can get right now. So that means in order to have this one port MacBook, Apple has to sell a slew of crapola so that you can connect all your stuff to it. Crapola is the technical term. Apple doesn't even have, if you want to charge your iPhone from your laptop or sync it, Apple does not sell a lightning to USB-C cable. You have to have your lightning cable and then you have to USB, have a USB to USB-C cable, which is stupid. But even though this laptop isn't for me, I like the adventurousness of it. Apple is saying, look, this is a change. It's going to require <laughs> you have a briefcase full of dongles and adapters, but it's okay. We're, we're being ambitious here. We're taking a step. We're being adventurous. We know that this is going to be a slight challenge, but we're going to make it happen. But let's shift gears for a moment to talk about another element of how I approach podcast ad sales. And I was talking to somebody about this earlier today, and then I was remembering, oh, I should stop this conversation because it's in my talk. But that's okay. It was a spoiler. A big element of how we do podcast ad sales is veto power. The issue is kind of this. What we sell at Midroll are live host reads. So we don't sell injected ads where it's, you know, this episode is brought to you by somebody else talking. It's, it's the hosts themselves doing the ad reads. And since the host is doing the ad reads, the reason the advertisers are buying these spots in large part is because there's an endorsement quality to the ad. You know, when Gruber or Marco or Mark Marin or anybody who's on a podcast is reading an ad, there's some level of implied endorsement of I stand behind this product. And many of the podcast advertisers, you know, they'll send the hosts a Casper mattress or a box of nature box snacks or set them up with a free Squarespace website. And that way the hosts can talk from personal experience. They can say, hey, here's my experience with it. I genuinely love sleeping on my Casper mattress. And because that's what they're relying on and because that's the only thing we sell are these host reads, we have to give our hosts veto power. The hosts can say to me at any time, I'm not going to do any ads for Casper. I love, you know, Bob's Mattress Incorporated, I don't want to do any ads for, for Casper, and that's the host's choice. And because our hosts have veto power, and I promise this all gets back to Apple, Oops, hang with me, but because our hosts have that veto power, I'm the first line of defense, and my sales team at Midroll is the first line of defense, meaning, and we hear from them all the time, so I'm not even using these guys as a punchline, but when we hear from advertisers who are like, I have a natural herbal supplement to cure erectile dysfunction, or you know, I've got some ridiculous, embarrassing toilet-related accessory, the squatty potty, if you're curious. Um, I know that most of my hosts have no interest in that. So on the first line of defense, I say, you know what, I don't have anybody who's going to read that ad. I don't have anybody who's going to be comfortable saying, you're going to poop more comfortably if you buy the squatty potty. So we turn it down. And because of that, because we're a filter and because the podcast himself or herself is the final filter, we're selling ads to better companies which means our listeners, including me, are more likely to want to buy the things being advertised. What I'm getting at is it's expensive to listen to free podcasts because the stuff you're hearing advertised is generally cooler than what you'd hear advertised on TV or the radio or anywhere else. And I'm no exception. I, I don't just sell the ads. I listen to the shows. I wake up. Here's an ex a perfect example of my day by Lex Friedman. I wake up sleeping on a Hello Pillow podcast advertiser. I shave on the days when I choose to shave with a Harry's razor, podcast advertiser. Right this minute, I didn't even think about it, unplanned, I'm wearing Mott and Bow jeans. They're a podcast advertiser. They advertise on shows called The Art of Manliness and Sklarbro Country. I have a, <laughs> I didn't even think, this morning I had a cup of Tea Pigs tea. Tea Pigs is a podcast advertiser. My, I wear glasses that are super cheap because I'm a super cheap person, but my wife puts on her Warby Parkers. I snack on Nature Box. And it's not even 10 a.m. And I've used, I don't know how many, six or seven podcast advertisers because they're products that are genuinely cool, which is why our podcasters are willing to read the ads and why we sell to those companies. It all goes back to that veto power. Quality matters. So the point is, you have to give consideration and the element of sales that's involved here in every feature that you include and in every feature you choose not to include. And everything you write in the app store and everything you choose not to include in the app store and the ways you interact with your customer all reflect on you. And if you're a filter for quality, which obviously you care about your apps and you want them to do really well, your customers experience tremendous benefit from it. So this marks a great time to switch back to my made-up acronym. F. The F is for fix stuff. You should, well, no. You should fix things for your customers. That was a typo on the other slide. F is for feel heard. It's also for feel heard. You should make your customers feel heard. Now that I think about it, I probably should have gone with puff, but it's too late now. So remember, everything is sales. Always be selling. That's the mantra. Think back to yesterday when I showed you this preference that Apple added in, the pity preference. I guarantee you, Steve Jobs did not think this was the right feature. He said so. People emailed him and said, are you going to add a preference? No. 
But it was the right thing to do for grumpy customers like Macworld's Lex Friedman who complained about it. It was this Steve Jobs who said, fine, we'll put in that fix, we'll put in a preference. But it's not just about bug fixes, that's not my point. It's about hearing your customers and letting them know that they've been heard and adjusting when necessary. It's about not falling in love with your features, if you think back to the Apple Pro Mouse. It's about remaining flexible, about listening to feedback from your, okay, it's not gonna keep working. But you can fix your customers' problems without fixing their problems. In this case, Apple let their customers feel heard and they did exactly that fix. But sometimes it's okay just to say you're sorry. That's my favorite photo in the presentation, so if you don't like it, then there's no better photos at this point. But Apple, I remember yesterday, um, Apple, uh, Tim Cook says, don't use, use other Maps programs for now if you need to, it's fine. Uh, they didn't say, we're gonna fix Maps right away and stay tuned because tomorrow or next week or next month it'll be ready. They said, we're working on it. It's okay to be wrong, it's okay to screw up, as we talked about yesterday, it's, Apple's demonstrated repeatedly, it's okay to make lots of mistakes. And you don't have to fix everything right away. You have to remember to communicate. And this is a time when I said it's being Apple-ish-ish, not being pure, pure, purely Apple-ish, because Apple's not always great at this. I referenced it yesterday, so then I had to go quickly last night and Google and add a slide in here. But uh, with iOS 7, there was this problem, the white screen of death. And Apple, uh, iOS 7 was released in January, and this fix where Apple finally said, we're working on the white screen of death and we're going to fix it, didn't get released until March. But in the meantime, Apple took time to say, we're working on it. We're aware that many of you are experiencing this horrific white screen of death and we're gonna have a fix. You don't have to fix everything right away, you just need to make sure your customers know you're listening. Sales is listening. I hear you, you're right, it's broken, I'll fix it. Don't leave me, I love you. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of my wife. Uh, but so, now you listen. I'm, I'm gonna get to, uh, you know, I, I told you a bit yesterday about uh, the daily plate and how I would listen to the customers and tell them, you know, here's what we're working on, here's what we're not working on, and uh, here's where that feature falls in the hierarchy of all the crap we have to get fixed for you. But just letting them know they were heard, I think made a huge difference in our customers trusting us and believing that we were actually taking care of them and wanting to make things as good for them as we could. So POF, well, POF, be patient. Add the missing features later. Don't hold up your launch because not everything is perfect. It's okay to ship the iPhone without copy and paste. Be adventurous and ambitious and anarchic. You can release a MacBook that has just one port on it and deal with all the dongles for a while. Fix stuff. Make your customers feel heard. And always be selling. This is a word to avoid. Because I would rem remind you one last time, you are all salespeople. And what do salespeople want to do? <laughs> we want to make money. Whether it's for ourselves or for the company, we want to make money. And I think that you guys want the same thing. Even if your apps are about improving the world or making people's lives better, in general, unless you're you know, independently affluent, you're doing it in large part because you want to make a living doing it. I do it by selling ads, you do it by selling apps. It's very close. So always be selling. Every customer interaction, every feature, every app store update is an opportunity to sell your app, to sell yourself, to sell to your customer. This is the experience you get when you buy my app from me. So when you want to tell a grumpy customer to do this, you instead have to find a way to make your customers feel like this. Thank you very much. Two, three. Oh, I found the button. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Were you beatboxing? <laughs> All right. Any question? Um, I, I didn't really like when you said it's about fixing stuff. I don't want them to fix me. <laughs> so. Uh, oh, uh, yes. I'm sorry. Especially that. Don't fix him. Yeah, especially that other F. Uh, <laughs> without the fix. Uh, yeah. Questions? Questions? No questions. Question. Okay. So if a customer is, um, well, giving you an email you don't really appreciate, um, and uh, what do you think about just not answering? You know, it's easy, doesn't take too much time. It's a really good question. Uh, and if you didn't hear it, you know, if, if you get a really crappy email from a customer, or an obnoxious one, what about just not replying at all, right? I'm okay with it. There are customers who you're not gonna win, right? There's a customer who only is ever gonna be grumpy and gonna be unhappy. And when you have a customer who's only ever gonna be a problem, 
and who's making it pretty clear from their tone or from their interactions with you that they're only ever going to be a problem. I don't see a reason to spend extra time out of your day catering to that one customer. I believe that... Philip, Better? Good? Okay, I'm working on the French pronunciation. I believe you made the point earlier today, right, where you were talking about uh, Will Shipley saying, just send the redemption code, right? Just send the offer code. If somebody comes and says, I want a free upgrade, just send them the code, don't even think about it. I think it's okay at the same time, if somebody's only going to be a jerk, to just delete the email and not reply. You have to pick your battles and you have to pick what customers you're going to spend time on because your time is valuable. Uh, so I'm totally okay with it. Okay, thanks. I don't recommend it as, you know, my standard response is if any customer is unhappy, I'm not going to ignore them because I think most customers are fixable. <laughs> Maybe even if their issues aren't, the customers themselves are fixable, the same way you can fix stuff. Go ahead, fix me. I, I mean, I had this one case, which is interesting, where uh, somebody had a, a bug in Disk Alarm's App Store version, which I know I, w I, I, I hadn't fixed yet, but the, the non-App Store version was there, so I sent them a promo code for the non-App Store version, obviously. But in general, though, I, I, uh, what I remember from Will is that he said, basically, if you're going to give this guy one promo code, maybe he's going to speak to his friends and you're going to sell two copies. There is a, a big chance that this is going to happen. So don't be cheap on giving away stuff in this case. And I think my instinct, maybe wrongly, would be most customers, most of the time, are going to be worth at least one reply. Like, it's very rare to me that I would say, let me give up on the very first correspondence. Because even the angriest, most profanity-laden email from somebody, if you write back and say, I hear that you really, I know Daniel Jalkit sometimes writes back to his customers and says, look, I'll have to happily answer your question. Just send me another email where you're a little bit less profane and we'll get into it. And some customers, that just pisses off even more, but some get it and calm down. But just replying and going back and saying, look, uh, I'm sorry, you're clearly very frustrated. Here's a way to fix this problem, I think is very helpful. When these people are really frustrated, what I found is that if they, if you, your first reply, you show you're a human, they, they tone, they, they tone down really, really quickly, and they often apologize profusely. That's so exactly. that's why the first re reply is key. That's exactly what uh, Daniel uh, um, Jacob was saying at, I think, NS conference. He did a couple of years ago. You want to talk? Um, it, <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Kung Fu su support, no, he, he, I think he didn't have a question. He was reminding me about Kung Fu support or support ninja or whatever. Right, he had this right. brilliant talk where he was basically explaining you reply them very nicely and all of a sudden there are little sheeps and they're like, oh, yeah, I, and, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry I didn't know you could be a nice guy. And don't tell anyone I said it um, because I don't think that your customers are children uh, unless you make kids apps. But it can be helpful to treat your customers a little bit like children, right? If I'm mad at my kids and they're, or no, let me try again. If my kids are mad about something and they're yelling and screaming, I try to talk to them in as calm a tone I can. Uh, at a certain age, that's just going to piss them off even more, but, which is another reason to do it, frankly. <laughs> but, so around 40, when but, they're 40. But, you know, responding calmly can, can, can smooth things down, can calm things down. Not for everybody. You're definitely going to have the, the jerks who are just never going to chill out, and those are the customers I would just happily, you know, the email to send is, I'm sorry to lose you as a customer. Or, or send them a special kind of promo code which makes the app twice as expensive. <laughs> that it's probably, there's probably a way to do that. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you, Lex. Thank you. Big round of applause for Lex Friedman. <laughs> and, uh,